about now, I'm Jay. C-Dub on the beat. Back against the wall, CL20's knocking ready. IGI's tripping, validated, shoot ready. Brown incarceration, got my people living daily. Hey, yo, what's good with everybody, man? I hope everybody's having a productive day, feeling blessed. And like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. So with that being said, man, interesting video, man. I got this story a while back from a fellow 18th Street member. It was an incredible story. It was a crazy story. And then when you, when I heard it, I was like, oh, he gave me the chills telling me. I wish he could tell it to you guys himself, but he's doing good now. He's a family man. He walked away from the life and uh, wanted to share his story with you guys. So here I am about to give it to you. So with that being said, hit that subscribe button. Hit that like. Always leave a comment. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section. Check the links in the description for my Apple and Spotify music. Go ahead and run my streams up. And you can check out my playlist section on my YouTube channel and check out my music right there. Thank you guys for you guys' time. Most importantly, thank you guys for you guys' support. Yeah. Now we're going to talk about Hawaiian Gardens, the neighborhood. And everything that I read on this report, everything, and before I tell you guys a story, I just wanted to check up on the hood, read up on the hood. I only knew, I only met one person, as far as I remember, from Hawaiian Gardens, and that was Chino. And he was, when I was transitioning from the active side to the, to the SNY side, he was my neighbor. And uh, he used to break down all the Sudanian politics to me, and he was on his way going to the SNY as well. He had long hair. They had Hawaiian gardens on his chest and stomach. Um, good individual, man. One of the very first like Southerners I ever met that actually showed me love. So I wanted to do my history and read just a little bit about Hawaiian gardens before I presented this story to you guys. And what tripped me out about this story, there's a part, there's an aspect that I want to point out to everybody that's watching. Everybody. So they describe this city as a city of hate. That these uh, Latino and Hispanic gang neighborhoods... Probably produced a lot more crimes in regards to hate and retaliation based on, you know, race, based on color, based on skin tones. Way more than white rhetoric. That's what I'll say. Uh, 116 crimes were committed between 1995 and 1997 by whites. The rest was 164 by Latinos and Hispanic gangs towards this particular group, a particular skin tone, I will say. And that's the part that blew my mind, how a gang can adopt a concept of hate and a different supremacist ideology from another group and inflict it far more than the group of themselves that actually promotes it. But so much crimes were committed, right? But they said the start of it all was in 1980. A Hawaiian Garden gang member actually got shot and lost his life. And that case has never been solved. No one ever found a shooter. No one's ever been convicted of the crime. But obviously, the Hawaiian Gardens, the gang in itself, the Hawaiian Gardens gang in itself spun a narrative, I think, on the basis that since it started off on one big Hispanic community and another ethnic group decided to, you know, migrate and gravitate towards this area because of the poverty, because it was cheap housing, low income, everything about the ghetto and the neighborhood as described as a ghetto and neighborhood, People gravitated towards there to make a living because it was an affordable living. And they seen that as an immediate threat and uh, began targeting one another based on skin tone. So there's so much history in Hawaiian gardens in regards to these kind of crimes. I, I just read the list one right after the other and I was just like disgusted by it, to be honest with you. But I understand the 80s and the early 90s, mid 90s was a different era an era that I was never a part of because I grew up in Tulare County where there's, there's not a lot of uh, hate like that towards one another. But one individual actually got 16 to life in prison. He happened to be the son-in-law of a Mexican mafia lieutenant that took the life of somebody in particular. And uh, another life was taken. A 29-year-old man was getting out of van and he was shot and left there, unalived. And it just so happened that Alberto Martinez, a.k.a. Badger, who I'm going to tell the story about, he shot himself in the leg. And uh, he tried to say he was a quote-unquote Mexican, but he uses the derogatory term for paisas. Shot him, but he really shot himself. But it just so happened to be the same caliber bullet that was in his leg was used in a May 1997 hot one of that same individual, that 29-year-old that got out of the van and lost his life. So the individual winds up going to prison for that. But how they describe this article before I get into the story is they basically said these Hispanic gangs, these Latino gangs, these Latin and Hispanic communities, they're always in the worst of the worst neighborhoods, low poverty, low income neighborhoods committing these kind of crimes. Trafficking, gangs, violence, you, you name it. 
It all exists in these low income neighborhoods. And he did. The reporter literally pointed out, I was like, you don't see this happening on uh, Beverly Hills. You don't see this happening. He started naming all the rich areas in Los Angeles. He goes, but it happens over here in these neighborhoods where these gangs are in control of. That's that made me think like that's the that's the only reason gangs are gangs now and gangs are so powerful now because they haven't reached those depths and those heights of society. Probably because we did it to ourselves. We saw ourselves in the foot, but we did it to ourselves that you can't do that in a rich neighborhood. They won't allow that. Law enforcement is going to crack down a lot more harder than they would do these low income areas. So that's something to think about that. That's how, you know, mainstream media, uh, society, regular civilians, that's how they see it. Hey man, let it go on right there in those nasty little neighborhoods that we don't want. We're living better up here, less crime, less hate, less violence, less gangs. We'll live good. They can live and tear each other up and, you know, just maul each other for all they care. That's the point that it needs to be pointed out. I can elaborate more on it more, but I want to tell the story. There's an individual that gave me the story. He's from 18th Street. He was in Atwater, 2014, but there was a Sureño already on the yard pushing his weight around. He was already in control. He was already answering to the Mexican mafia, but he wanted to get involved in the politics. You know, he was doing a long time. You know, obviously there's a lot of members from 18th Street that are involved in the Mexican mafia. For example, Coco, the individual I did a couple of videos about and what took place with him in the USPs with the MS-13 members. That's him right there with the black hand behind his ear. And you got individuals like Huero Caballo. Then you got individuals like Puppet. And other individuals that have been made in the Tila Mexican Mafia that are from 18th Street, that's given these 18th Street members a strong mentality. And what I mean by that is everywhere I've been in in prison is a trip. SNY Mainline. 18th Street acts different and gets treated different. They're looked at real different. I'm, I'm still learning this. I'm still learning. I'm trying to understand why is it that 18th Street is for one, so big, and two, hated on so much by every other Sudanio gang when they were actually Sudanios themselves. Even on the SNY side, when I used to deal with a lot of uh, Southerners that were from Southern California, 18th Street stuck with themselves, 18th Street ran with themselves. They hardly mingled with any other Sudanio or ex Sudanio from different neighborhoods. But if you intermingle with all these other Southerners from different neighborhoods, they, they always say the same thing or have the same opinion about an individual on the SNY that's from 18th Street. Still blows my mind to this day. But you got individuals like that that have given these individuals, you know, a high prestige and a, and a very strong and respectable reputation because of the size of their gang and how many members they have into the Mexican Mafia. So he's from 18th Street. The individual that's running the yard ends up paroling. So um, uh, Diablo from 18th Street decided that he was going to take the yard, but Badger was there. Diablo from 18th Street had two years to the pad and picked up 40 years in Florence. I guess in the FCI, he was obligated per Mexican Mafia orders to take out somebody, and uh, somehow, someway, your broomstick ended up right here in somebody's throat, and um, he wound up getting 40 years for that. Well, the Mexican Mafia member who's responsible for not only making that call, but who he had to answer to then I was Joe from Alley Boys. And obviously Diablo had to continue to be in contact with Joe and take orders from Joe. And Joe pretty much told Diablo, this is your prison. Well, Badger's there from Hawaiian Gardens and Badger, for some reason, wants the yard. He wants to take over the yard. Starts politicking against Diablo. While the individual that told me the story, he kind of stepped down. He wanted to get in the part. He wanted to be part of the Mesa, but he was allowing his homie from 18th Street to earn his bones because he didn't know nothing. He didn't know how to run a yard. He wasn't really well educated when it came to the Sureño program and how to govern the Sureño government, but he was obligated and instructed to take over the yard. But now you got Badger over here from Hawaiian Gardens wanting to take over this yard because he wants that yard for himself. But Diablo's ignoring Badger little by little, but eventually a lot of things take place on the yard where Badger becomes Diablo's right hand man. So now they're Macedo's working together, working on behalf of uh, Joe from Alley Boys. So. Badger starts extorting the Sureños for money, for dope, you name it. Anything that he can get out of a Sureño, he started getting out of them. And at the time on this yard in particular in Atwater, the homie said 18th Street was deep. They were probably the deepest and biggest ones out of the Southern faction. So, But they were hated on by everybody else the most. And he said in the federal penal system, nobody likes when the 18th Street members run in the yard, period. 
And for the fact that Coco got made and he happened to be from 18th Street, he started throwing his weight around. The reputation just got bigger and bigger that these individuals, as soon as they get made, as soon as they get some type of power, they start abusing it. They start mistreating Sureños. They start looking at everybody like they're less than and they get big headed and they get too powerful. Next thing you know, the power gets to Diablo's head because he doesn't know how to run a yard. And he's being educated by his right-hand man, Badger, on how to run a yard. And all he sees is Badger's extorting and, and exploiting every Sureño for their money, for their riches, for their property, for their dope, for their food. For whatever it is that they're doing, whatever they have their hands into, they have their hands into it too. And they're just taking from their own manpower. So now you got two tyrants on the yard abusing their power and nobody else could do anything about it because Joe from Alley Boys is in charge. And I guess Joe from Alley Boys had a... a a very strong reputation of getting people removed off the yard. That easy and that simple. And then one day something happened. A transition change that uh, was unexpected and everybody got blindsided, including the 18th Street. Now the 18th Street member believes that Badger didn't want nobody from 18th Street running the yard. So Bobby from Norwalk gave him permission to take over that yard. So one day he comes out to the yard and he's approaching Diablo and Diablo is looking sad. He's looking miserable. He's looking shamed. He's looking disgraced. And he's like, what happened? And he's like, man, Badger took the yard. Badger's running the yard now. I ain't, he told me to step down. And he said he could see it on his face, a discouragement and sadness. Because it's like he felt like he got punked for that yard. And it's the one thing about it that was, was more trickery and more uh, devastating of the story. Is that in order for him to run this yard properly, Badger was in his ear like, man, just put me as your right hand man. Put me as a mesetto. I'll teach you this. I'll teach you that. I'll do this and do that so you ain't got to do it. Because Diablo didn't know how to run a yard, that was just his way of, of being a snake and swinging his, his way into a position, and then he overthrew the mesero. It was like, right, right here, you're gone, step down, this is me now. So it's like he manipulated Diablo's ear just to get close to him, to take control of everything little by little without Diablo even knowing it. So when the time permitted, he got at Bobby from Norwalk at the time and was like, hey, man, I just give me this yard. Bobby said, okay, go ahead and take it. Took the yard straight from Diablo without even being seeing it coming, without even recognizing all the traits of being betrayed, the traits of an overthrow, the traits of tyranny, the traits of mutiny. He didn't see none of it coming. So as he's talking to Diablo, Badger pulls him to the side and he's like, hey, bro, you can't talk to Diablo no more. That's it. Yeah, no, no more. Leave him alone. And they put Diablo on disregard, the whole Sureño program, everybody there, including 18 street members because they were advised by the Meseros you got to leave Diablo alone. So they made him do mandatory yard, mandatory 113 burpees every yard. Nobody was talking to him. Nobody could talk to him. Had him on the shine, had him there by himself feeling less. Just sitting next to, a, just standing next to a fence by himself. And pretty much Badger was telling everybody like, Bobby from Norwalk, his instructions were plain and simple. Like, don't even trip, man. I'll talk to my carnal Joe, but go ahead and take that yard. So that's what he did. He did it because one Mexican mafia member wanted the yard and wanted the money from it. With the whole impression that I'll talk to my brother, he'll be cool with it. Well, guess what? Joe wasn't cool with it. All the 18th Street members strap up because what they're thinking is that they didn't want nobody from 18th Street running the yard. They didn't like the fact that they were told that they couldn't talk to Diablo. And they uh, they pretty much strapped up and went to the yard and put a circle around Diablo. I'm like, hey, fool, this ain't right, bro. You need to get at your carnal. You need to send an email out to his uh, Joe secretary and tell him what's going on. Well, they wound up getting an email back from Joe's secretary, a message from Joe, from Alley Boys. And he basically said, hey, bro, I never made no changes. I don't know nothing about that. So you guys do what you guys got to do. So you know what I mean? It's 18th Street, hella deep. They're going into the cells, pulling out bangers. Like, all right, bro, we just gonna, we're just going to go to war with all the Sureños and we're going to go to war with Badger and we're just going to mess this yard up until we figure out who's going to take it. But most importantly, until Diablo gets it back. But there was a big problem that was circulating. It was like a whisper, a whisper to everybody Nobody knew or even was assuming or can get confirmation that Badger at the time was part of the Black Hand, was a Mexican Mafia member. It was just whispers. But they were willing to blast this individual just on the basis that Diablo was working for Joe. And if Joe says so, we're going to blast him. Plain and simple. Whether he's Mexican Mafia member or not, he was throwing his weight around. He came over here, wanted to take over the yard. That was his main objective while he was on the yards. I'll need this yard. This yard's supposed to be mine. And eventually he accommodated himself with the yard. So they all come out deep as hell and they're all backing up Diablo. Badger comes out with 40 Sureños all strapped up and they meet in the middle of the yard. So the letter gets presented. Diablo and Badger are talking. 
Badger reads the letter. He looks nervous because from when the 18th Street members, when they read the letter, they interpreted like Joe said, hey, man, get rid of him. Blast him. Do what you got to do. So they were already in their heads like, man, we're going to take this fool out and we're going to take his win and we're going to show him how what 18th Street does and then we're going to give the yard to Diablo. So instead, Diablo approaches the situation, gives Badger the, let uh, Badger the letter. So Badger's looking all nervous. He's looking all weary. He's tripping out on it. He doesn't know how, what to go about. But a couple of incidents had to happen. Diablo gets the yard back and a couple of removals uh, take place after that. Another individual named Soldier from San Diego tried to do the same thing with Bobby from Norwalk. Tried to take over the yard and what happens? They do a removal. They smash them. They get rid of them. Because they already seen it time before when Badger tried to do it. Like, nah, no, anybody trying to take over the yard, if they're disobeying the Meseros, if they're disobeying Diablo's leadership and Joe from Alley Boy's leadership and his authority, we're just going to smack them. We're going to remove them. That removal goes down. Then another removal on a Sureño from Oxnard goes down. Diablo and the shooters end up going to the hall. Guess who takes over the yard again? Badger. And what do you think Badger did? Got power happy. And actually started plotting on the individual, the 18th Street member that was actually backing up Diablo's play, who was actually influencing Diablo, saying it ain't right, bro. He can't take the yard like that. Bobby's not responsible for this yard. You need to get at Joe. The same person that was putting everything into Diablo's ear, he was the prime target now, Badger. So a player from 18th Street goes up to him. He's like, hey, bro, keep your eyes open, bro. They want to blast you. I think they're going to blast you, dude, when you go to yard. So a homeboy gets strapped up. He goes to yard. Four hitters. Non 18th Street members, different Sudanians from different neighborhoods, put him on the fence. All what bangers told him to wait. And Badger comes out like, you know, he's Al Capone or Al Pacino, walking to the fence and starts confronting him about the whole Diablo situation. And pretty much asked him, like, man, I heard you were trying to blast me. And that's when Badger comes out, was like, hey, bro, do you even know who I am? Do you even know if I'm mobbed up or not? The same whispers and the same rumors that they were debating about, like, man, should we blast this fool? But, hey, man, we've been hearing that he's a Mexican mafia member. He was working for Artie. He was doing all kinds of stuff. It was just rumors. They didn't notify nobody that, hey, man, he's a black hand. He didn't have a tattoo or nothing. They didn't see nothing. So that same thing, he's asking him, like, you didn't know I was mobbed up? And he was like, bro, it, I, it doesn't matter. What's wrong is wrong. It was right is right. And what you were doing wasn't right, man. It was wrong what you did to Diablo. And Badger thinks about it for a little bit, and he actually tells him, he goes, you know what, you're right. I was wrong. I was wrong for what I did and the way I went about it, but I still did it. And that's the point. I wanted this yard. I took this yard. This yard belongs to me and Bobby from Norwalk, plain and simple. But since you were willing to defend your homie on the basis of what's right and right and what's wrong is wrong, Everybody here on the yard wants you blasted, but I'm not going to let that happen just because you told me the truth and you spoke your mind, and I respect that. And he actually stuck to his word and didn't blast the homie at all from 18th Street. But he wound up getting snatched up because, you know, the administration there, whatever they call it, SIS, found out he was a Mexican mafia member and transferred him to another facility. So after hearing this story, man, I was like, man, did you, you could have lost your life, man, behind dirty politics. But you, most importantly, like you stood up for your homie. Stood up for your vario more than Sureño politics, more than politics in general. You were just backing up your homie's play. I get it. And he just wanted to end the video like this. He came home. He almost got stabbed on the yard. But he's out now. He's free. He's living his normal life. But he let, the way he ended the phone call, he ended it like this, man. He's like, bro, when it comes to Sureño politics, the best liars always win. You just gotta know when you you just gotta know when you can tell the truth. And that right there, that's how we ended the conversation. And I was just like stuck, like. He ain't lying, but for some reason, I can't break that down and explain it the way he's thinking about it. But that's how I'm going to leave the video. He said, the liars always win, but you just got to be able to know when to tell the truth. So thought I'd leave you guys with that story, man, and an interesting story. So with that being said, like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. Peace.